Hello everyone. In today's lecture, we talk about customer profiling. Our customers can be young or old, male or female, thin or overweight. Building a profile of our customers can give us a much more concrete idea of what customers are like. Hello everyone. Welcome back to Marketing Analytics. In this video, we will discuss customer profiling. First, let me show you a map. This is a map of the United States. As you can see, this is a state level map. The country has been colored in different shades of blue. Some states have darker blue colors and some states have lighter blue colors. And the darker blue color represents a higher intensity of Google search. In this case, the map represents the search intensity for Dollar General the discount retail store. So my question for you is, what do you see? And in the South, Midwest, and the Northern States, we see a higher density of search for Dollar General. So the next question is, does this search intensity tell us a little bit more about the customer profiles of the retail store Dollar General? There are potentially two layers of causes. First is, where are Dollar General stores? If Dollar General has a lot of stores in Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, West Virginia, and then maybe those are the states where people tend to go to Dollar General more often. However, if Dollar General is more of a national level retailer and there are stores all over the country, then this search intensity difference represents some kind of customer profile difference across different states. And further, if you are familiar with the demographic distribution of the United States, especially the household income discrepancy across the U.S., you would suspect that low-income families are more likely to shop at Dollar General, and therefore we observe this pattern of search intensity. So as you can see, building a customer profile is a necessary and important step for businesses to understand better about what their customers look like. And therefore, they may be able to tailor their advertising or promotion messages to their customers. So now let's take a step back. In the previous lecture, we have talked about advertising as a revenue generating model. Now let's look at the non-advertising based revenue generating models. There are, generally speaking, two types. First is subscription. Examples include Netflix, Office 365, cloud-based storage, Amazon Prime, among the others. The second revenue-generating model is transaction. In a transaction-based model, customer does not pay a fixed installment on a monthly, weekly, or yearly basis. Instead, customers pay each time they buy something, a product or service. Commonly in the retail business, brick and mortar stores. So business to consumers, B2C. Usually the transactions are of relatively small dollar amount, and there are many transactions. A Walmart supercenter may experience thousands of transactions every hour. On the other hand, there is B2B type of transactions, business to business. This type of transactions tend to be of much larger dollar amount, and uh, the number of transactions is much smaller. An example would be an oil and gas service company like Slumberjay. It sells service packages to a large conglomerate oil and gas companies such as ExxonMobil, each transaction may be worth millions of dollars, but you don't have a lot of transactions. So among these two types of transaction-based businesses, the B2B type of businesses, because you don't have a lot of clients, it tends to deviate from B2C type of businesses where for B2B type businesses, you have Salesforce to build a relationship. So the management of the two types of transaction-based businesses are somewhat different. 
for B2C business to consumer type of business, the focus is on to understand the customer profiles, to segment customers, and then we can position product accordingly and target the specific type of customers that we want to sell to. In B2B type of businesses, because of the high dollar transaction value, it turns into more of a relationship-based business handled by professional salespeople. So in today's lecture, we're mainly going to take the perspective of a B2C type of businesses and examine how we might be able to segment and profile customers. Fundamentally, we want to answer the question of how are they different? How are our customers different from each other? The schemes we use to segment customers can boil down to two big classes. First is profiling. Second is behavior. For profiling, we're trying to find out who the customers are. And at the end of the day, we can usually come up with a description of what kind of people our customers are like. On the behavioral side, the focus is on what the customers do, or more precisely, what the customers did. So based on their browsing, their purchase history, we know what they have done, so that becomes a good indicator of what they might do in the future. So here's a comparison of profiling versus behavioral-based segmentation of customers. For profiling, it tends to be easier to summarize. Often, we don't have to apply modeling or complicated analytics tools to deal with profiling. Very often, we can directly summarize the data using the tools that we're going to discuss together with this lecture, such as charts and pivot tables, we can easily summarize the profiles of our customers. On the other hand, in order to do behavioral-based segmentation, it usually requires us to use more sophisticated analytics. Secondly, a profiling-based segmentation is easier to communicate. For example, we can describe our customers as middle-aged, family size of three or four, with an income of fifty to $75,000, and occasionally work from home. So for that description, it's very easy to follow what kind of segmentation are we talking about. On the other hand, for behavioral-based segmentation, they can be difficult to explain because it's often based on a certain type of purchase patterns. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about how we may be able to simplify the purchase pattern into a few measurable metrics. And third, because profiling tend to be more broad stroked, it's easier to plan mass targeting. By mass targeting, I mean the marketing activities that can reach a lot of people although the message may not be tailored very much for each individual, we tend to use the same message to target a large group of people within the intended segments. On the other hand, for behavioral-based segmentation, it usually requires a customer relationship management system or CRM system in order for the system to either tell the salespeople or to a more sophisticated, for example, direct mail generating system to decide what kind of message and how often you send a message to the customer. So for all these three items, as you can see, profiling has some of the advantages and the behavioral based segmentation tends to be more expensive and more complicated and may require special skills to generate. However, here's the fourth important difference. A profiling-based segmentation, it tends to be less directly associated with purchase activities because you have been focusing on who they are, who the customers are. So from who they are to what they buy, there is a gap. Although these two are correlated, they are not the same thing. On the other hand, behavioral-based segmentation tends to be directly associated with purchasing activities. If you do a good job with behavioral-based segmentation, you tend to be able to create much more granular segments. And as a result, you will be able to tailor your marketing messages to customers at a more individual level 
and these messages or promotions, they tend to be more effective. So as I said, the goal of profiling is by summarizing who the customers are. We're trying to associate that with what they buy or how much they buy. Here are a few commonly used dimensions for customer profiling. Geographic. So this is the most obvious. People in different geographic regions very often have different preferences for products, for services. For example, consumers on the West Coast and consumers on the East Coast have a slightly different preference for coffee brands. And as we have just shown on Dollar General, the popularity of different retailers may differ across different geographic regions as well. Second, probably even more often used is demographic. So we often summarize our customers by age, family size, gender, income, education, religion, and race. And the great thing about demographic information is they are relatively easily accessible because the U.S. Census Bureau produces very detailed demographic information across different geographic regions. Here are some examples of maps generated using census data. And a third, in terms of customer profiling, we can use psychographic lifestyle metrics to profile customers. And this dimension is often based on survey data. In separate videos, we will introduce how to use these two tools, charts and pivot tables. And for both charts and pivot table, they attempt to achieve the same goal, that is to simplify the data you have so that more data becomes less data, and the less data becomes charts. And both are great tools for summarizing data and to generate customer profiles. Charts can be used for different purposes. And as you will see in separate Excel videos, there are many different types of charts. So the question sometimes boils down to how do you choose a chart? And here are four different purposes for creating a chart. We may create a chart for comparison, to compare, for example, men versus women, high income versus low income. And second is for distribution. So we have already actually done this. For example, using a histogram to summarize the grades of a class. That's distribution. And third is relationship. By relationship, I mean how are two different customer metrics related to each other? Does browsing a web more leads to higher purchase amount? So that's the relationship between two different variables. And fourth is composition. The most straightforward way to think about composition is, let's say you have a pizza. Part of it is pepperoni, part of it is cheese, part of it is sausage. Composition would tell you what percentage of the pizza is pepperoni, cheese, or sausage. So more specifically, here's how you choose a chart. First, deciding what do you want to show. Do you want to show comparison, distribution, relationship, or composition? I'm going to use comparison as an example. Are you comparing among items or over time? If you are comparing among items, you use a clustered column or bar chart. So here's what they look like, column charts, bar charts. Example, as we have talked about advertising in the previous lecture, would be ad spend on different media. So if you spend advertising on different categories, you want to compare the spend on different categories, a column chart or bar chart would be able to show that. So the height of the bar would reflect expense, and different bars would represent different types of media. So alternatively, if you are making a comparison over time, then you use column or line. So column or line. And an example, as we have shown, you can plot out the ad spend over time using column charts. So if you recall, we have plotted out bullets, pulsing, 
and even type of advertising spending over time. So I'll leave the rest of this chart selection plot to you. Similarly, you can see that if you want to achieve the purpose of distribution, relationship, or composition, how you may be able to choose different types of charts. And in separate videos, we'll show how you can produce different types of charts in Excel. Thank you, and keep up the good work.